want to start by saying good morning. Uh, we've already visited with our folks here. Good morning to our folks on uh, YouTube and Facebook. We are uh, meeting together for the first time since uh, early March. Uh, and so we've got uh, a good group here. I think they're happy. Everybody has a mask on, so I can't really tell uh, how, how happy they are. But I think I'm, I know I'm happy to, to see them. I got a thumbs up. Good. Uh, I'm happy to see them. And if you're watching us, uh, we appreciate your presence as well. Uh, we know with uh, the most recent week we've had, it's been kind of another difficult time. So a lot of folks are being cautious as they should and want you to continue to, to do that as well. Uh, but we will start meeting on Sunday mornings uh, for the next couple weeks and kind of see how that goes. And we may add Wednesday nights and then uh, Sunday nights and then hopefully some classes uh, as the, the weeks roll on. Uh, we did have to cancel Bible school. Uh, if you didn't weren't aware of that, we wanted to share that again this morning. Uh, just the small rooms and the workers and uh, lots of uh, issues. We hated to do that, but felt it was the most safe thing to do. So we'll keep those materials and we'll use them next year, hopefully when we do uh, get back to, to some semblance of normal and, and have VBS, but we're gonna miss that this year for sure. We wanna welcome you though. We wanna bow and pray this morning and get to a time of worship together uh, as we're gathered in the Lord's house. So let's pray today. Uh, Father, I thank you uh, for the opportunity we have to meet in person online father because the the word says that we worship together in spirit and in truth whether we're together or apart your presence is just as real uh, no matter where we may be sitting this morning so father i pray the holy spirit would just come and dwell richly with us that he would be close to us today uh, that we would feel his presence and that we would honor him and glorify him with everything that we say and do in your house this morning father it is good to be together I pray that you would keep us safe during this time. I pray you be with Brother Jonathan and Philip as they lead us in worship. And Father, for all of us, as we look into your word together, I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would illuminate it, would uh, turn the light on for us, that we would hear it, understand it, and God, most importantly, that we would apply it to our hearts and to our lives. Father, thank you for all that you've given us. God, I just pray for our country. Uh, I lift up so many needs that we see right now. Father, may we as your ambassadors, Father, as the word calls us, plead a case of grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness to everybody we come in contact with. Uh, Father, heal our land. That's our prayer as your people this morning. God, be with us during this time of worship. May you be honored and lifted up by everything we say and do. We love you and we trust you and we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Oh, that's sweet to hear. Jonathan, come lead us, brother. Good morning. I uh, would like for everyone to please stand. Lift up your voices this morning. And let's praise Jesus. I've entitled, or the first song that we're going to sing is Praise Him. Praise Him.
It sure is good to be back at Brumley Baptist Church, isn't it? Amen. It's been such a long time, um, but what I've been, what I was thinking about is that what we've been through is sort of like you have surgery, and the doctor says that you're not going to be able to walk for six months. So you have to adjust and have to do what you can do to get by during that time. And I think that's what the Lord's done to, our, to the world, not 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 to just our country. It's it's you know in the whole world, He's uh, allowed this to happen to make us uh, attentive to what it's going on and what He wants us to do. And uh, you know we we have to stay near home now, so we change our ways. I've I've been walking about a mile not a mile, but, I, but an hour every morning. And I met a lot of, of the neighbors that I wouldn't have got to meet. And, uh, you know, just we have to adjust and do different things. But, but God, God is good. Uh, a lot of people have lost their, their, their jobs, but, but he's, he's, still, he's, he's still in control. And um, we have people that we need to pray for, as Brother Billy said, Doris's grandchildren, Art Montgomery, Betty Ritchie, and we're glad that everybody is watching us and that everyone is here. My faith looks up to thee, number 509. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. two.
Jesus.
Take your Bible this morning, if you would, and turn to Acts, the 10th chapter. Thank you, Jonathan and Philip, for leading us in worship this morning. It's just overwhelmingly good just to sit with God's people and worship together. So I appreciate that so much. It's amazing the stuff that we take for granted until you don't, don't have it for a period of time. I want to say thank you as we kind of get started. Uh, Megan and, and Darla, Miss Landers, did some painting. They kind of touched up our choir loft here, and Brother Don put the chair rail back there for the choir. So when we do get to be in the choir again, we'll, we'll have that back there, and it'll look nice. Eli? Eli. Let's, I hope you've been watching, okay? But we've been going through the book of Acts, verse by verse, kind of chapter by chapter. And chapters 1 through 8 have centered on Peter as the early leader of the church. Peter and John both, but primarily Peter. He's been the guy who's kind of led the charge, being preaching at Pentecost, being leading the disciples, that sort of thing. In chapter 9, Luke is writing, and he, he turns the scene a little bit to the Apostle Paul. Paul, who at the end of chapter 7, or chapter 8, excuse me, is there stoning Stephen and being one of the ones who's approving to the first Christian martyr. And then he's on his way to Damascus. He meets Christ. He is converted. Incredible, incredible story. And now he kind of is quiet again for a little bit, but I promise you, chapter 11 and beyond, he's going to be the leader in the second half of the book of Acts. Okay? However, we have an interlude here, a medium, a middle part, I guess the better word is in a medium, of Peter being the focus again. So I want you to do something this morning before we get into the text. I want you to uh, pretend you're Luke for a minute, okay? And you're living in the first century. And you have encountered Jesus, you've met Jesus, and you realize how important it is as a doctor and as a historian to write down a record of who Jesus was, okay? And so you start with your gospel, and you go back and you tell about his lineage in the Old Testament, and then you tell about all the things that he did, okay? Okay? And Acts is just the second part of Luke's letter. Acts and his gospel went together. Really, there's even there's not even a, a break between the two. He just keeps writing. And as he's writing, he wants to put into, into the book of Acts the really, really important things. And he wants to spend an adequate amount of time discussing each one of those things. Now, here's why I'm, I'm laboring and, and telling you all this. Look at chapter 10. Okay, you got your Bible open. It is 48 verses. Welcome back. I'm going to preach on all 48 verses this morning. Yeah. Now, here's why. There, there's no break in it. it. It's one story about Peter and Cornelius. But I want, the reason I'm pointing out this, as he's writing on this scroll and he has a limited amount of writing to do, like he, he can't write everything that he wants to. It's not like he can just, oh, I'll just go to Target and you know, buy another piece and I'll just keep writing. He, he's got a limited amount of writing space. He spends a lot of time on this story. Okay? So when I read it, and as I studied this week, I realized, wow, this must be important if he spends this amount of time devoted to it. And so I titled the message this morning, An Unfinished Story. And hopefully by the time we're done, you'll understand why it's an unfinished story. Stand with me, if you would, in honor of the reading of God's word this morning. It is so good to have you with us in person and online today. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. I'm reading out of the ESV translation today. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, who, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the chance to read it and study it. I pray that you give us clarity in our reading and our understanding this day, that you would be lifted up and honored and glorified. If 
Father, we love you and we trust you. We pray in Jesus' name and God's people would say, Amen. you may be seated again this morning. I want you to note kind of three main ideas from this story. It is so interesting to me. I, I, I decided literally back in early November that I was going to preach through Acts. Okay? So we're in June. So we're quite a ways away from there. But if you've noted, I haven't really gone away from that since the first week in January. We've gone through Acts verse by verse by verse. We're in chapter 10 today. Chapter 10 is going to be all about how people from different ethnic backgrounds need to come together for the cause of Christ. God's sovereignty is really cool sometimes when, when he gives us eyes to see it. That, that's just what the text is about. And so that's what this whole story is about. So I want you to notice three things. Number one, I want to introduce the three people in the story. Cornelius, a religious sinner in Caesarea. Cornelius, a religious sinner in Caesarea. Note in verse 1, it says that he is a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Verse 2 tells us that he was devout, that he feared God, that he gave generously, and he prayed to God. So he is a Roman soldier. Well, we know enough Bible to know Roman soldiers are guys you don't want to trifle with. You don't want to mess with. And if he has ascended to the position of centurion, centurion, you see the word there means century or hundred, meaning he's in charge of a hundred Roman soldiers. So he's a guy that tells tough guys what to do and they do it. Okay? So get a picture of kind of who he is. And so he's there, but he's also got this other side. He's got this emotion for God. Look in verse two. He's checking all the boxes. It says in verse two that he's devout that he's God-fearing, that he gives generously, and that he prays regularly. So I have titled him a religious sinner because he's not a follower of Jesus, but he is very religious. There is a great difference, amen, from being religious and checking the boxes and doing the things and being a follower of Jesus. Now, followers of Jesus usually do the things, but Cornelius has it kind of in the other order, in reverse. He's doing the things but he doesn't know who Jesus is. By the way, by before this chapter is over, he's going to hear and respond to the gospel. So his emotion for God is clear. And I think because of that, he has an encounter with God. Look with me in verse 3 through 8. And I'm not going to read all these again because, again, we've got a lot of text to cover. Okay? But he is there, and the Bible tells us, and you heard it, about the ninth hour of the day, he's just going through his business, middle of the day, middle of the afternoon. All of a sudden, he has an encounter with God. An angel of the Lord comes to him and says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to so-and-so town. I want you to find Peter, and I want you to talk to Peter. So the messenger comes from God, and the message is, go to Joppa. There's a man named Simon Peter. Here's the house he's in, and I want you to go talk to him. Now, we need a little context. Go back to chapter 9, the very last verse. Notice what the verse says there at the end of chapter 9. Peter is in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Now, here's why I know God's already working with Peter. Because in this story, we got Cornelius who's in one town, Peter in another, and I firmly believe that God is preparing both of their hearts for something radical. Peter is staying at it with a tanner, okay? The man's name is not Tanner. <laughs> I've known people with that name. It's a guy who prepares animal skins, makes leather, makes covers for things like you know, my Bible cover and things like that. That's, that's what this man does. The Jews would have looked at a guy who does that and said, ooh, that's fine if he does it, but I'm not going to his house. They would have considered that unclean. Now, they wouldn't have thought badly about him, but they wouldn't have gone readily to his house. And Peter's spending the night there. So God is already stirring something in him about this other group of people. Cornelius, again, is religious, but he doesn't know Jesus. He's in a different ethnic group in a different town, but God is telling him, hey, you need to go talk to Peter. So you see what's happening? God is kind of positioning everything in the right way. And I would just remind us, and I'll go on to point number two, God is always working. No matter the circumstances we see around us, even if we think the world is going crazy, and I think we probably think that it is, God is still sovereign and he is still at work. And he can do things with people when their hearts are turned the right way. So we have a religious center in Caesarea. Notice number two. Peter, a reluctant soul winner in Joppa. Verse number nine. Okay, and I'm going to go quickly. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up from the housetop at about the sixth hour to pray. He became hungry. I think Peter was Baptist. Verse 10. 
He wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. I may have used that verse at my house last night asking my wife if supper was ready. It did not go well. Verse 11. I missed y'all, by the way. It's hard to tell jokes when nobody's in the auditorium, but I tried the last few weeks. Verse 11. He saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. So here is Peter. He's in a different town. He's staying with a tanner. He's staying uh, at Joppa with a man named uh, with a tanner. And he has a vision. And, and he has three visions, according to verses 9 through 17. Here are the contents of those visions. He is in a trance. He is in some kind of godly state. God is communicating with him just as he has done with Cornelius. Again, this is the book of Acts, so things are really different the way God is dealing with people in the book of Acts than what happens to us today. This is how God speaks to us today. This is the full, complete revelation of God. But Peter gets this vision, and here's what the vision is. The Bible describes it, the, the Greek language is interesting, it, it, a sheet is really the best way to describe it, just this big area, and on it are all these animals. And the idea is, hey, Peter, you're hungry, go eat any of these things you want. Now, now again, we know the Bible, right? What is the Jewish, the idea? If someone is a Jewish person today, they have to eat a meal a diet plan that is called kosher, meaning there are things that in the Old Testament God has said were unclean that they are not allowed to eat. Pork would be one of those things. Now, if we go back and look at the Old Testament law, we would understand why at that time to those people God said not to eat those things. There, there are lots of things we know about now that if you don't prepare and store pork the right way, it can make you really sick, right? Well, in the Old Testament, they don't have any way to do that. And so what God does is during that time to those people says, just don't eat that. Okay? What is happening now is God is changing the way he deals with people. So notice what he says. Peter, eat. What does Peter say? By no means, Lord. I would never do that. Why? Because that was not just eating. That was God's law. This wasn't just about food to Peter. This was about obeying what God had told him. And so God's order here is, hey... This is what we're going to do now. We are doing something different. So even though Peter was dreaming about food, it really wasn't about food, was it? It was about how God was about to change everything in the life of who the church was. God was going to do something different for the first time in literally thousands of years as far as dealing with his people. And so look at verse 15 and 16. Just want to notice what God overrules and what he says. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Can I tell you this morning, as sinful as I am, I am pure because God has made me pure Amen. through Jesus Christ. And so are you in Christ. And that's what the verse is about. And that's what this vision is about. So look at verse 17. There is confusion. Peter, it says, is inwardly perplexed. He doesn't know what to do. So he goes upstairs on the roof and he has three visions Go back downstairs in verse 17, he has three visitors. Again, the three people that had been sent by Cornelius there to talk to Peter. So he goes down and he talks to them, which leads us to number three, Cornelius and Peter, redeemed saints in Christ. Last point this morning, Cornelius and Peter, redeemed saints in Christ. Okay? Verse 24, on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. Now, I skipped a few verses. Let me just catch you up. All that happens is Peter and these three visitors talk about, okay, well, why are we talking? Why are we meeting? And they tell him, hey, our boss said, Cornelius said, we're supposed to come talk to you. And he said, well, we need to get together with Cornelius. And so that's, that's what's happening on the following day. Verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet, worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. We should bow before no man except for Jesus Christ. And as he talked with him, he went and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with, with or to visit anyone of another nation. 
But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. All the folks who are not Jewish in the room ought to say amen. amen. This is us now being included by the gospel. Again, God is, is sovereign and can do whatever he pleases, whatever belongs to him. And for hundreds of years, he has called the Jewish people his chosen people. By the way, he's not finished with them. He has more to do with them at the end of the book. Okay, We can talk about that sometime. But for the first time, Peter is going to be commanded to go with the gospel to the whole world. Go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Remember what was the mandate? You will be my disciples in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we are now at the ends of the earth. Because this is God's command. All right, it, it's time to go forward. It's time to take the gospel to everyone. So here is the conversation with Cornelius. Here's the reception. They come together at their house. And, and they start associating. And simply, folks, the fact that they are together is scandalous. It would be like, well, the Jews go over here, and the non-Jews, the barbarians, the Greeks, whatever you want to call them in Scripture, go over here. That that was kind of the economy of the day. You had the Jews as a group, and then you literally had everybody else as a group. And they segregated, and they went into their own groups, and they stayed that way. And God is coming to say, that is not how it should be. The reception. Verse 27, look at the review. As he talked with him, he found all these people gathered. Verse 28 I read, so pick it up with me in verse 29. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa, ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging at the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So he says, I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Therefore, we all are here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So they have this discussion, this interaction of, okay, why are you here? How did you get here? How did we, as two people, end up together? Because obviously, there's not a lot in common with these two folks. You know, Peter and Cornelius don't have a lot of common interests or things that they would both be involved in or things they would both be doing. So that's the conversation. So look in verse 36 and notice the clarification. This is the, the, the sweetest part of this conversation. I'm going to start in verse 34 just to give us context. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, meaning God doesn't treat anybody different. Peter is, has been revealed to him through this. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness through his name. Amen, amen, amen. That's just the gospel. And, and so he gives the gospel. He gives him the message of the gospel, that Jesus came, that he lived, and that he died. He gives him the Messiah of the gospel, who Jesus was and what he's done. And then he gives him the ministers of the gospel, that here's, here's what we ought to do. He told us to be proclaimers of the gospel. He told us to do what, what Jesus commanded us to do. He told us to go out and be his witnesses in all the world. And so that's what's going on. For the first time, remember who Cornelius is? Look at the top. He is a religious sinner. He was doing the stuff. He just didn't know why. And now he has the gospel. And because of the gospel, it changes everything that he is. Now, church, listen. I have one uh, of all the stuff I wanted to say, of all the stuff that I studied and thought about and, and was important to me this week, here's what I want to say. Peter is from a Jewish background. And that's who he was. That was what he was born in. That's what he knew. 
right? Cornelius is from a non-Jewish background. Yet when they come together, all of that stuff becomes secondary because of who they are in Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friend, anything that any of us ever want to be, the first thing we must be is Christians, followers of Jesus. Amen. And when we have that in common, most of the other stuff seems to kind of float away. That that's, that's what we got to focus on. That's, that's the story of Acts chapter 10. Is that yes, you're from different backgrounds, but Jesus brings you together. Look at verse 44, the conversion of Cornelius. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on him or on all who heard the word. The believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out. Look at verse 46, even, or 45, excuse me, even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Christ Jesus. And asked them, and they asked him to remain for some days. Oh, praise God. The gospel trumps everything else. The gospel comes in and overshadows and does away with everything else. Of all the things that may be different about us, our age, our education, our socioeconomic stuff, our backgrounds, our preferences. Jesus Christ saves all of us from our sin and our separation from God. And that's really all that matters. Dear friend, I, I know that everybody and their brother is offering solutions for everything that's wrong with our country. And I, I know that everybody on TV, talking heads from every show, say we ought to do this and we ought to do that and we ought to do this and we ought to do that. I'm just kind of simple and backwards, and I just think the gospel would really fix everything. Because I think if all God's people would act like God's people, we wouldn't have problems with all the stuff that's going on. We would love one another, we would care for one another, and we wouldn't care what we looked like or what we spoke like or how we lived or what our cultural background was. We would be brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And friend, and I, I think that may need to start with us as believers, that we go out and show the love of Christ, just like Peter did. Peter and Cornelius didn't understand why they were being drawn together, but they both were sure of the fact that God was behind it. And if God was the one that was going to reconcile them through the gospel, all that both of them had to do in this story was this. Here's our application. All they had to do was one thing, be obedient. They had to listen to God and be obedient to what he was calling them to do. I pray to heaven that we'll do the very same thing. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the day. I thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your house. And Father, for those who are here, for those who are watching, for the opportunity we had to sing together and to look at your word, we praise you and we thank you for these things. Father, I pray the gospel would so permeate our lives and our hearts that there wouldn't be any room for anything else. Father, give us your heart for one another. We know that you love us because the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And that's every single one of us. Yet you've loved us with a perfect love. May we do our very best to show that same love to everybody around us. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you've given us. And we pray that you're pleased with our gathering this morning. We love you. We trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people would again say, Amen. Uh, we, we won't have a formal invitation again, but if there is any of you that need to visit with me, whether you're here or online watching us, uh, contact me. Let me know. Uh, I'd love to, to visit with you. For those who are joining us online, we're going to dismiss y'all. We uh, appreciate y'all being here, so I'm going to turn off the broadcast here in just a minute. I will let you know we'll continue to broadcast next Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, for that, for those who are here, we'll visit for just a minute pray together again. We'll dismiss y'all uh, as well. Brother Jonathan, would you mind dismissing us with a word for, for the end of our broadcast tonight?